So thank you all very much for joining us today for this uh, first Next Steps session of 2023, uh, where we'll be hearing from three librarians about their experiences with genre labels. Um, and I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce our three speakers who are, first of all, we'll have hear, be hearing from Laurel Oshiro, who is uh, librarian, uh, the early childhood and elementary school librarian at Sacred Hearts Academy. She's been there since 2010. Um, she won the HSTE Making It Happen Award in 2016, the Golden Key Award in 2019, and the Hawaii Catholic Teacher of the Year Award in 2020. So we're very honored to have Laurel as one of our speakers, and she'll be talking about how she genrefied her books in her um, library during the COVID pandemic. Uh, our second speaker is going to be Mary Healy. She's the librarian who manages the Marine Corps Base Library in Kaneohe. Um, and she <clears throat> will be talking about how that library reorganized their J fiction section by genre. And the next speaker is going to be Andrea Wade. She's the youth services librarian at Waiheoa Public Library and has been there since 2017. And she's going to be talking about her experience categorizing their easy reader books into levels. And um, so we will really enjoy hearing from all of them so that each of them is going to speak for a few minutes and then we'll be opening it up for questions. So uh, let's go ahead and start off with Laurel. Okay, thank you so much. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Laurel Oshiro. Can you hear and see me okay? Okay, great. Um, so uh, uh, during the pandemic, it was the perfect time to take a second look at my collection. I had been following a bunch of uh, librarians on Facebook and that's where I started to get inspiration. And then um, I decided to um, bite the bullet and go ahead and genreify. Um, I dabbled in it here and there, uh, but when I, it didn't make sense to just do it a little bit. And eventually I ended up doing all 10,000 books in the collection. Uh, so I, uh, with the 15 minutes, I did a presentation on this with HLA for the 100 year uh, conference and I, they recorded it. So if you ever wanna get all the nitty gritty of, of it, um, you can ask them for the recording, but if you have come across any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, uh, I'm happy to answer them. I'm gonna go ahead and give you a tour of my library. I have, I have slides, but I feel like seeing the real deal is much more exciting. So um, let's go on a quick tour. Oh, um, uh, before I do actually um, uh, really quickly, some of the benefits that came with, uh, or actually before I start, I color coded, genreified, and added uh, picture icons to the genre labels. So I did three things uh, to the collection. So let's see, okay. So it's a small um, library. We have, yeah, over 10,000 books. Um, we have um, 200 students. So um, over here is my picture book collection. And uh, picture books are blue. And you'll see, um, for example, this is the courage section. And if you look closely, uh, oops, sorry. It has a picture of a tiger, uh, sorry, a lion on it. And it says the word courage. So it's two parts, it's blue. It has a picture icon and it also has the word. So it's really wonderful. Um, if you'll notice too, also all my shelves are not taller than three feet, but it's def it's catered to um, preschool, uh, kindergarten, and first grade as they're learning um, how to read. So when they come to the library, um, I'll have 20 kids in here. Um, with COVID, there were there was um, uh, not as many volunteers could come on campus, so I was shorthanded. So I had to find ways so that my students could be more independent. Um, I don't recommend genrefying your first year as a librarian uh, because I had been here for um, 10 years. I felt really confident in what my um, 
my patrons were interested in and what kinds of books they needed. So that helped me with um, the uh, sorting process and labeling. So I work in an all girls school. So I have books about girls and, and you'll see pictures of girls on the sides. Right now, my most popular um, section is unicorns. Um, it makes so much more sense too, because um, when a five-year-old is looking for a book, they're not gonna say, oh, do you have the book by Roald Dahl? A five-year-old's not gonna ask for that. A parent might, but because parents weren't allowed on campus during COVID, um, it was all up to the kids. And that's kind of empowering for the children. So um, the kids would say, I want unicorn books. And so I now, instead of saying, oh, okay, there's a unicorn book under the letter B for Brown and a unicorn book under the letter R for Rogers. Now I can say, oh, what letter does unicorn start with? And they'll say U, and I'd be like, great. So go to the U section and you're gonna find unicorns. Um, I don't recommend genrefying at the college level and even the nine through 12, you I mean it could work, but um, it's, very appropriate for the little ones. So in a, in a, um, our school starts at age three. So for the three to 12 year olds, it makes a lot of sense for them. Um, the brown section is the Disney section, which is my most popular section. So I don't put any authors on the labels. I try to clean up the labels as much as possible. So there's not as many letters. Um, and it's really simple and clear for the kids. Uh, if a student says, I, oh, I really love sharks, I'll be like, okay, what kind of animal is a shark? And they'll say it's a fish, or we'll learn about that. So my green section, I apologize for the Blair Witch Project uh, quality right here, but um, I'll say, great, it's a fish. So let's go to the fish section, and then they'll look for um, the fish label on the side, and then the green stands for these are my picture book um, animal books and they'll be able to find the shark book. I would have one letter on there and that would be S for shark. But otherwise, everything is pretty as simplified as possible. So we have mammals and then we have a letter S. Oh, mammal, sorry, this is for a seal, a baby seal, not a shark for that one. And then I created a new section called Global Learners. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that a lot of um, parents wanted their, their children to learn another language and education was heading towards more globalization with the use of technology, the heavy use of technology and COVID. So I created a global learner section. So if the students wanna learn how to speak Hawaiian, my bilingual books are over here. Um, purple stands for global learners. And then it's also purple right here. And then it has the Hawaii label. And then I have a Spanish section and a Japanese section because we started offering Japanese and Spanish uh, last year. Um, once, uh, oh, so that's, those are for my um, younger ones, but it's been really wonderful because um, I have two animal sections. I have my uh, picture book animal section and then I have my, middle grade animal section. So these are also animals, but if you, when you open up the book, you'll see like heavy text versus the picture book, which is primarily pictures and large words. So I no longer worry when a child checks out a book, I have to like check each book. Um, I, you know, I let them borrow if they're very passionate about, it, but sometimes they judge a book just by the cover and then they go home and they're disappointed that they carried home a heavy book that they didn't intend to have and they end up not reading it. So by having them color coded, the kids are happier with their choices. And um, I know exactly, so we, um, myself and some library students over the summer, they helped me sort the picture book section, but um, for the rest of the library, my intern, Lauren Nielsen and myself, we went through every single book. We touched every book in the library and evaluated what would be the best section for it. I know Follette has a genre kit, but I had already done my project, so I don't, I don't know how it works. I think it's like 200 something dollars and they'll evaluate your collection and they can do it, help you get it started. Um, 
I like the personalization of each book. It's more work, but I'm able to become intimately familiar with every book in the library. So in addition to lab relabeling all the books, we also um, ended up weeding 4,000 books. When you realize you have so many books on kindness, you're no longer like hoarding these books because you realize like, I have way too many books on kindness. I can finally let this book go. And that's kind of Marie Kondo's philosophy too, is you put all the top, all the like things together in one pile. And then you look at things instead of looking at different sections of the house, you just bring everything together and you look at what you have and you take inventory, you thank the book and then you can donate. Um, Orange is Ready Readers. Uh, these are the I Can Read books. This is the only section I didn't genre five, but I did take off um, the second letter. So it's just the first letter of the author's last name. That's the only section in the library I didn't genre five because the kids who are still um, learning how to read, they didn't seem picky about certain genres. I'm still thinking about it. This is my early chapter section. Uh, these are generally first, second, and third grade, but other grades can borrow them too. These are in baskets. Um, they have a pink label on the side and they have a label on the front. So this one says biography on the top and then it's in the biography basket. And then in the baskets are in alphabetical order. Visually, it looks really stunning. Um, I didn't do it for picture books because picture books were way too heavy. And for the kids to pull them out, it didn't work for us. But for the early chapters, it worked really great. I think I have like two more minutes. I'll wrap, start wrapping things up. Um, my most popular section is my graphic novel section. That did not get genreified. The only part of it that I genreified was the manga. Oh, sorry. The manga section. So we're still building it up. Um, otherwise, it's just a red label with the word graphic novel and then the author's last name. As they're getting older, they're starting to understand um, alphabet, uh, alphabetical order. Uh, the back wall is my yellow middle grade books. Um, so I have fantasy. If you look closely, you'll see a yellow label and it has a unicorn. And then on the bottom, it has the uh, first three letters of the author's last name and the number it is in the series. So, um, once again, I tried to clean things up. I didn't, I took off all the extra letters. When I used to have F for fiction, um, and then I had the author's last name underneath it, all my books got shelved under the letter F. So that was really frustrating. So now when it's just the author's last name and then the genre, it's um, been really easy. I have the signage uh, matches the label on the books. So I have fantasy, uh, humor. I'll just read them off to you so you don't get dizzy. Uh, fantasy, humor, Nene Award, historical fiction, realistic fiction, uh, mystery, horror, science fiction. Um, I tried out classics. It wasn't, the kids didn't seem interested in classics. So I reintegrated into the regular collection. And then adventure was too much like fantasy. Most of the books were in there, so I got rid of adventure. And then I have yellow nonfiction. And this is where I kind of broke the rules of, this one is very subjective and I'm still evaluating the effectiveness of it. That's my alarm for 15 minutes. So, um, <laughs> but um, I, I um, labeled, each section. So this one is biography. And these are my biography books. Um, like I said, these are uh, nonfiction. So it'll say bio and I'll say world leader. And then this one says bio US leader, but there's no author and there's no number. It's just this column is biography. This one is literature. So that would be, what is literature? Eight, is that 800s? Oh yeah, poetry. So it says poetry. Um, so this is this could be controversial. Um, I'm still testing this out. I, I, I wouldn't call myself a genrefication expert. I'd call myself a guinea pig. So you can learn from my mistakes. But it took me 
um, an entire year to genrefy um, the 10,000 books. And so far, uh, shelving is a breeze. It takes, um, I can have three fourth graders shelve about 100 books in 20 minutes. Um, uh, yeah, so in terms of efficiency, it's really fast. Uh, there's lots of benefits uh, to that, but um, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and um, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> much it, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Laurel, for giving us a not only a talk, but a tour of your beautiful library and all of the work that you did and also explaining your thought process in it. Uh, so now we're going to be hearing from Mary. Thank you. Hi. Okay, so it's good I'm going second because we borrowed pretty heavily from Laurel. Um, we, well, okay, I'll start by saying Rowena, um, who works here, she's our children's and youth programmer, came from King County System. And in King County Library System, they have their picture books genreify. So she has wanted us to genreify our picture books since she started. And for me, that was too daunting of a task to start with. So we decided to do um, fiction, um, early chapter books, like eight to 12, juvenile fiction first, although we are planning to do picture books next. It's still very daunting, but <laughs> I think now that we've done juvenile, at least like we have some ideas about how it can be done. But then we did, we saw Laurel at HLA, I wanna say 2020, 2021. Anyway, um, we saw her present and then we went to, Oh yeah, 2021. 2021. We, we saw her and we went to go visit Sacred Hearts Academy. So we got the whole tour and kind of some ideas um, about how to do it. Uh, for us, we wanted to do it because we're pretty busy and we oftentimes am leaving, I'm leaving like one or two people in the library by themselves and kids need a lot of help. So we wanted to make it easier for kids to find their own things. Um, so we did, we selected the genres, we narrowed it down. I think we have nine. Um, I'm going to read, hold on. Fantasy, humor, horror, sci-fi, historical fiction, diversity, we call it our world, um, real life or realistic, uh, mystery, animals, and adventure. And we just finished. It took us a long time um, from, because we, we never close, you know, we're constantly circulating books. So um, there are six of us here. Every single staff member was involved. We all would take turns pulling carts of books off the shelves and deciding what genre they were, changing them in the catalog, and then, you know, putting a sticker on them and then putting them back on the shelf. That took a long time because then we'd have to do them as they came back. Um, and then we moved them all over Christmas, you know, when it was a little bit slower, we moved them all into their own sections. And then the last thing we did was we had to go all the way back through the collection and redo the call numbers so that people can tell. Because there was this brief period of time where the you could read the call number, but you didn't really know where the book was, which was maddening for everybody involved. But we have finally mostly finished um, redoing the call numbers. The only ones we're missing are the stragglers that were currently checked out. So um, we, were ju we just finished. So it's kind of hard for me to, to tell you about results. Um, I will say that people, and you know, observing people for years, people do not, adults do not search the catalog. Kids don't search the catalog. They don't really know how to do it. We haven't made it easy for them. And unfortunately, we recently switched to a new catalog, um, not my choice, but it's even harder. It's, we have, I want to say 50, we have a lot of locations now on the same catalog. So even if you manage to find the title you want, you open the record and there's like 50 call numbers. So you don't, so some people who are anti-genre will say, you know, oh, kids should learn how to navigate the catalog. And I, I say most of the time I can't navigate the catalog, like much less our, our patrons. And I will say you walk, most of them, you watch them, they walk in and they just kind of head into the stacks. Like they don't even know to, or want to ask how to find something. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for them to find their stuff. Um, 
so far, I think humor is our most popular category. It's got like, you know, Diary of a Wimpy Kid in it. And, um, but yeah. So, but our, ours is only juvenile fiction at the moment. Everything else is, now, I mean, we could go down a rabbit hole. We don't have Dewey Decimal numbers either. Everything is word-based now. So everything we're doing is kind of trying to make it so people can find books in the way they search for them, which is not <laughs> using our catalog. I mean, the, the day we have a catalog that looks like Google, maybe that'll be different. But for now, we're stuck with what we've got. So uh, it's really the, the thing the catalog is for is for like our, our really frequent users and our staff and, and everyone else just kind of wants to wander into what they're looking for. That's all I have. That's probably shorter, right? Thank you, Mary. That's uh, very interesting. And it'll be interesting to hear what your assessment of your uh, decisions were after you've had a chance to see how it all plays out. But thank you very much. So now we'll move on to Andrea. Hi, everybody. Um, OK, so uh, my project, when I first came into Wahiwa Public Library in um, 2017, it was about February 2017, uh, one of the questions that we would get asked all the time was what were good books for children who hadn't learned to read yet? And we had the easy reader section and the easy reader section was all organized by author only. And if you know anything about easy readers, um, they're published by all different kinds of companies and those companies have their own leveling system and so for parents who are looking for books for their children especially children who haven't quite yet learned to read it's very hard to find books for them and so when i would get this question we had um let's see i think i have the series here we have this my first i can read book and so I would just tell people, look for this here, look for that label, because that was all that I knew how to tell them because all of the books were just completely out of order. So we got this question enough times that I uh, said to my manager, I think, uh, you know, we need to change this um, so that parents could find books based on the reading level of their child. And uh, I too thought it was gonna be really daunting. It did take a long time. Um, but I think in the end, it was ultimately worth it. Um, the first thing that I did was I contacted Danielle Todd at um, YNI. She was the juvenile librarian uh, over there uh, for at the time. And I had seen based on what we had in our database that she had organized her easy readers by color. And so when I reached out to her, she told me it's best to just organize these books by a color or something that doesn't indicate um, it. Like you don't want to make kids feel bad for having um, like maybe a lower level on like a number scale. So if you give them a color, that makes them feel a little bit less bad about that. So she was the one who introduced me to that and she gave me some ideas about how to move forward. I ultimately, when I got that information from her, I could not get it to work with my collection. So I did some research. Um, there was a website that I found online. Unfortunately, I could not remember what the website was. I, I have to look for it, but I'm sure I could find it again, but I just don't remember what it was um, at this time. And um, basically that website gave me kind of an idea of how um, the different publishers organize their levels. And from there, I started developing a rubric. And um, after that, I just started going through every single book by hand. So I, I started in 2017. I think we began this project in 2019. And then I was still in the process of finishing this when we closed for COVID. Um, so when we opened back up, we had, we had everything um, had everything ready for the kids. So we've we've been running this now since 2020. And um, I've not had any parents come up to me and ask me this question about where do I go to, I mean, they'll ask me like, 
which uh, which section they need to go to, but I don't have to sit there and tell them, oh, I'm sorry, I have no idea which books that you guys should be using. So now we just tell the parents to go based on color. And I ended up um, choosing there, I think are six different colors. So it was pretty simple for me. I just did a rainbow. So I had pink, red, orange, yellow, green, and then the top level is blue. Um, some people I think would probably not bother doing a blue section that you could just move those into early chapter books. Um, but because they were kind of similar in size, I figured we would just do another blue section. So I, that's my smallest section within the early chapters. Um, so ultimately how I did this was I would go through every book that we had and I would take this and then just open it up and sort of see what was on the page. And so if it had just very minimal writing um, and repetitive words, so blackfish, oldfish, I don't know if you guys can see that, sorry. Um, not a whole lot of writing, just basically getting kids used to the language and sight reading, then I would put it in the lowest level pink. So this one has that little pink label. We also have the easy books label that we have on all of the, the other books. Now, unlike Laurel, I did not take off the author. <laughs> I kept that part, but so everything is still organized by author, but it's now just sub-organized by color as well. So um, I'm not gonna show you every single book that I did, obviously, but um, for Dr. Seuss, you know, he has a few more words. Um, more blocks of text. And so for him and his books, he usually gets an orange label. Once I did this, um, I don't know, I think maybe I worked on this for a really long time. Um, but once I got through, I started noticing that there were patterns. So in books that had the My First I Can Read label on it were probably gonna be in pink and red. So I could already sort of make judgments um, based on what the publishers already had on their books. Um, for, we're starting to get more graphic novel easy readers. For those, because I figured that might be kind of complicated for some kids, I put that in the yellow section. Um, and also they usually have a few more words. Um, and then finally, we go up to the green section. Green section is basically, it's gonna have larger blocks of text like this and fewer pictures. There's gonna be a lot of quotation marks. Um, it introduces speech um, between readers. So you have to assume like who's speaking. Um, and then that one is almost the top one. And then finally, when we get to the very top one, this one is mostly text. And then this one will basically move right into the early chapter books. So this is the early chapter books right here, which we also ended up doing a genre label for because those these were also not separated out. But one day I said, we got to separate those out too. So now when parents come in, we and they don't, you know, know where their kids should start. We just say like, we'll start them in the pink books. And if it's too easy, um, then you can move them into the red books. And if the red books are too hard, move them into the pink books. And you can just keep going all the way up until you get to the early chapter books. And this has um, proven to be very helpful for us. I've not had anyone uh, like a parent complain about this organization system. I think it's very helpful for them. Um, as far as problems, I didn't really have too many. It's just that you have to go through every single book individually because of the way that the publishers do all of the levels differently. Um, in the future, I would like to see the public, the publishers actually work together to change their levels. But anyway, they're probably not gonna do that. Um, I am gonna show you what I ended up creating. Um, I did a handout that we keep on the, um, that we keep on, on the uh, shelves by the books. And so this is basically to just help anybody who's 
in that section um, to find what books might be okay. So even though we were told not to grade anything, um, like we don't put the label on the actual, um, like we don't put the level on the book, we just use the color, but this would give people a guideline to where they could probably start their children as they're moving up. Um, so that is, it, it, and if you guys want this handout, I can, I, I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, let's see. But I think that's all that I have to say about that. Well, thank you so much, Andrea, of, for giving us a, the rundown on your uh, system that you developed for your books and telling us how it uh, has played out with the patrons. And um, now I, I think we have maybe a couple of questions in the chat. So. Um, Uh, Laurel had asked if you could share your rubric, but I think your rubric is what you just uh, did the share screen on, Andrea. So I actually, my rubric is very long <laughs> and um, it's very long winded. It's, it's like 10 pages long. Um, I will be happy to share that with anybody. Um, I just didn't think anyone would probably want to read through that this time. But yeah, if you want that, Laurel, just let me know. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and let's see, I think there was a, a question from Arlene earlier that was about, uh, that was for Laurel about um, what kind of order she put it in, in her books. And Laurel did answer that question in the chat, but I don't know if Laurel, you want to expand upon your, the answer that you gave to Arlene. Oh, for the, uh, oh, Arlene asked if the, um, the middle grade books are um, arranged in alphabetical order. The answer is yes. So they're um, only for the grades four to six middle grade books. Um, they're in alphabetical order because by then they've learned it and they've mastered alphabetical order, but they're first organized by genre. So the humor books have A to Z, the fantasy books are A to Z. Um, yeah, so in the catalog, like uh, Harry Potter will be uh, yellow dash R O uh, yellow dash fantasy dash R O W for J K Rowling dash one, so book number one in the series. Um, uh, yeah, I have um. Uh, sorry, I think there's one more question. There probably. Oh, do you ever have a problem with books fitting more than one topic? Um, Absolutely. So, uh, for example, uh, the very hungry caterpillar that falls into a lot of categories. It's counting. It's uh, about food. It's about um, I think there's colors, and so there, there's a couple. Of, I think that one. There are a couple of books. So I, um, I based on what I learned from that Facebook group of. 10,000 elementary school librarians from around the world, the discussion thread was put it in the section where you think it's most likely to get borrowed. And so I, that would be my mantra, which section is it most likely going to be borrowed? So it is subjective, but it helps when you know your audience really well. So in one library, um, they might know like, oh, the kids are really into dragons and knights. So they would probably put it under dragons. But like in my library, I would probably, uh, let's say my students are really into, um, not really into dragons, but they're really into fairy tales. I would put it under fairy tales or something like that. Um, it's, uh, but, um, oh, actually, does anybody else wanna share? I, I have a, some, a slide with the benefits of the genrefication. Um, Andrea or Mary. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, we just like, it, uh, yeah, there were a lot of questions about it. Um, I had a rule because we every single staff member worked on this project. I had a rule that no one could change someone else's decision because it's a matter of opinion. The only one that can change someone's decision is me. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it was just like it has to go somewhere. So just pick one, uh, you know, sometimes it's like, which, which section is full, <laughs> like which, which has more space in it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good answer too. Yeah. So we, um, uh, in the summertime, I think was, oh yeah, Mary, you mentioned picture books. That's like the hardest section to genre because there's 
it's just humongous part of everybody's collection. So uh, that was actually the first section I decided to genre because I had the number of volunteers. I had like 10 um, LAS students and they were looking for summer um, opportunities for community service. I'm like, hey, I'm community service. So they all came over and we just had a big discussion. I, I never felt more alive as a librarian having these discussions about which books. So we like we started off just a really raw like, oh, cats and this these books are going to go under ocean and this one's going to go under honesty or whatever but you had to know what each book was about and that was also eye-opening because some of these books I thought it was about one thing and then I flipped through and I was like oh my goodness this is a totally different story so that was really really helpful uh, but we also based the categories on just the size like you mentioned Mary um, I tried to keep the size of each category under 50 books or so um, because if it's too big then it, it then the books kind of get start to get lost so if I notice like okay this is a like friendship is a humongous category how can I make this um, a little more um, manageable or whatnot so like I have a math section for under picture books but then I have a counting section for picture books because counting is a specifically junior kindergarten thing um, another interesting thing is that um, at uh, for math standards they don't learn decimals until like fourth grade so that's like age 10 and that my my population is ages 3 to 12 that means like more than that means only like more than half of my population can't even read the labels and the parents aren't on campus so how can I make it easy for them and helpful for them but um I'll, sorry Andrea yeah I, I don't want is this a question about how like like overlapping and how you decide where you're going to um put different things yes okay that's what it is just double check um so Mine's fairly easy. I think I err on the side of if the book seems like it kind of can go in between. And, and I notice this a lot, especially between the orange and the yellow section, then I usually will err on the side of putting it in the easier section. Um, and I, I think um, it's not maybe as difficult as it would be for genrefying all of the different books just because I can make that decision and decide like oh you know this is if 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 a person is not reading at the yellow level then there's some books that are in the orange level that they think will sound oh this is like kind of easy but it's actually maybe a little bit harder than the other books in the section and I think it would help build confidence for, for them so I just sort of err on the side of like making it in the e putting everything in the easier section um our yellow section and the orange section are the largest sections that we have so I'm always trying to find more stuff to put into the pink and the green sections um the pink and the blue are the the sparsest of the the ones that I have and then yellow takes up like a huge amount of space so I too will sometimes do what Mary does and say well you know I need more books in this other section so let's put it down a little bit but for the most part um I try to keep everything as close to what I think uh the the level would be and if I'm just not sure then I will put it in the level below Okay, thanks, Andrea. I think we have a couple of questions that are sort of related to each other. Jessica asked, do you keep all the pink books on the shelf together and then alphabetized within the section? And then um, Arlino is also asking, do any kids or teachers ever want to read all of the Eric Carle books? And so they're all over the place. So I think the, the question is about co-location and what takes precedence over what else. Um, Andrea, if you want to start off with that one. Since you, uh, yeah, sure. So the to answer the question is pretty simple. What we do is we organize everything by color and then within the color we alphabetize the author. Um, so it's really simple. Uh, that sort of helps us with like our shelving, but then also, you know, people don't like Laurel said, people don't really care so much about the authors. Um, so that just helps us for shelving, but then like the levels are there. So yeah, we just direct people to go to the levels and then they find what they find. 
It also saves money too. When you realize how much money is spent on one topic or genre, then you realize like, oh man, this genre right over here, it's kind of looking a little outdated or wow, it's circulating so fast. It's constantly small. It really helps like you get a quick glimpse of your collection and you can automatically um, know like what you need to buy more of and what you need to buy less of. So I've saved my school a lot of money in that respect. Um, and then also in terms of organization, I can walk through my whole library in 10 minutes, I can put my whole library in order. Um, that was unheard of before. Like before I'd have to like look at each letter, alphabet, A, B, C, D, sing the song to myself, like a thousand times and then I put it in an order and it would take hours and hours and now it's like 10 minutes oh, that color is in the wrong place boom 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 so fast and um <clears throat> and then pulling books for teachers right now the teachers ask for books by topic so I can already anticipate I know Valentine's is coming up so I have a I forgot to show you the holiday section I have holiday in a separate shelf I'm gonna I just grabbed all the hearts Valentine's boom took it off and then I grabbed all the books on love and I pulled put them off and then presidents I'm gonna grab all the presidents boom and then I just send them out to, to the classrooms and I have a teacher self checkout and that takes me five minutes to like pull books for teachers each month so um, I had a section for Halloween I had to pull spiders pumpkins fall Halloween, you know, I had to pull like five different topics. I got all five topics in 10 minutes for the teachers and it was like 200 bucks and I wheeled it out to their classroom and then I had a checkout list and they all got like half of, more than half of the books were gone within a day. So it really helps um, for my efficiency and for the teachers too, to know right away, like this is what that book is about. And they don't have to second guess what the book is about either. But, um, yeah, oh, sorry, I think, uh, okay, yeah, there, Jessica Hogan, oh, sorry, what, were you, what would you like to share, Jess, sorry. Sorry, just finding my unmute. <laughs> um, yeah, just wanted to say, this has been so interesting, and thank you, everyone, for sharing what you were doing. Um, that's, it just makes so much sense, and it, um, it's been several years since I was a children's librarian, but um, when I was, I had the experience, I'm sure, like a lot of you, probably do I was responsible for the time for two story times and so I would get a lot of um, parents who would come to our reference desk after the time for twos you know because they're eight week series and they go on and you know sometimes there were families that were with you for a couple of years and so what they were looking for was um, I got a lot of requests for when your kids are between the ages of like two and four and you need bedtime stories and so they were like, what can you show me that's super quick? A lot like Andrea, what you had pulled for the easy readers, but these were like picture books that they were like, oh, you know, I, we just have like time for two books before they fall asleep. And I just want something that's really um, eye catching, but only has a couple words, you know, like all of the rhyming picture books that we know sometimes authors gravitate towards. So what, you know, what we did was we put orange tape on those books. And, you know, that was our really super basic system. And you guys have way totally evolved past that. It's really cool to hear. Um, but, you know, that was something that we found. And, and it seems like, you know, you guys could probably speak more to it since you're still, you know, working with that population. But, you know, it kind of depends on what your library is, right? And like finding the niches and, and what your users um, are using. Um, and then two other quick things. Thanks. Um, the other thing was when I was um, working in the schools as a speech therapist, um, we would really, really, really love the wordless picture books because um, we would use them in speech therapy to get the kids talking and to help them like work on their language goals. So like if a library kind of, and it, I know it's in the catalog heading, wordless picture book, like that's the subject heading. But, you know, for anybody in a school, if, if you're speech pathologist, like, you know, if that's a need to, who knows, you know, I'm just throwing it out there because it was something that, you know, me and my colleagues used as, as speech pathologists to kind of pull in materials that our library had. Um, and then one last thing, um, it makes me think now, like since 
uh, we use data about the circulation stats. Like in our public libraries, Andrew, we could probably even like target in on some reports that we could run to see if there's like circ stat changes after you modify your collection. So anyway, just a couple of thoughts. Thanks for the time. <laughs> yeah. Great job, guys. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. Um, if anybody else has a question, um, um, you can also uh, either put it in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and ask. And Andrea said she wanted to say something about the wordless picture books. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna direct um, the talk back to, to Jessica here on this point. Um, so our library actually does have a wordless picture book section because we started noticing that we were getting a lot of wordless picture books and we figured, oh, you know, these are completely separate from the other books. So we are in the process of working on one of those sections and we're creating labels for them as they come in. So that one we're sort of like in the process of putting together and we shelve that at the end of the other picture books. Um, and then also, yeah, I think it would be kind of interesting to see if, if, if there were any major changes in the CERC stats for the easy readers. Um, it would have happened a while ago, so I don't know how far we can go back, but maybe like 20, 2019, 2020 was when we started changing everything over. I was gonna circle back to the authors because you asked about putting authors together. Um, we try really hard to keep authors together when we when we do genres like the thing that people really ask for is series so like hard stop series all have to go in the same section right so um, mostly like that you know authors but definitely series all kind of stay together so we don't really have people that are that can't find you know that want all the things by one author that can't find um, <sighs> People don't like it when you move things around. And like I said, we just did this. So a lot of the feedback I've gotten is like, I can't find things because they, they've they taught themselves to walk here and walk here and there are the Wimpy Kid books and we have moved the Wimpy Kid books. <laughs> so um, we're, you know, but you know, in a year, I will be very happy to pull circulation stats and see, um, particularly since we, we really want this to be easier for the kids. And it's kind of the parent, parents are big on like Dewey Decimal and, you know, search the catalog and kids aren't, aren't really. So yeah, I'm interested to see. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely not a one size fits all. Genrefication is uh, really about your community and what makes sense, the most sense for them. So um, Arlene, actually, now that I think about it, I have had a, um, like two or three kids ask for books of, uh, that were made into movies, not movies, a uh, TV series. Um, so I am kind of starting to think about like, oh, should I have a TV series section um come up with a totally different color but um yeah it and it's gonna it's going to evolve i know that too i have 50 categories in my picture book section and i know those 50 categories are going to change in the next five years uh, depending on what's going on in the news and what the students are learning so it is uh it's an evolving process um uh but uh yeah it and it but it does make you very aware of your collection um, that's for sure. Um, may I share my screen? Does anybody want to add anything? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I made you a co-host so that you can share. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, we, well, we bought our labels, by the way. There's a question about if we bought them or, yeah, we bought ours. We bought them from Demco. There's a question here that says, did you create your own labels or, or make them? So in our in our case, we actually created some of the ones that we did for the graphic novels and the easy the or, uh, the early chapter books, and then for the easy readers, we bought um we bought some from Amazon. They're just regular labels that you can just affix. They're not special Demco labels or anything. Yeah, I created my labels, but I I know yeah, Demco and Follette have labels that you can purchase. I kind of custom I had a lot of different categories and I um I just went on Google I searched cats and black and white cat image and looked for the most simple image that looks good from far away 
it's very clear. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share with you. Um, I can put it in the uh, chat um, or you can also email me, um, but I can, I'm very happy to share with you my labels, my folder with all my labels and you can make copies. It, it took several hours to make. So I am like, I, time is valuable. So I wanna give that to you to help save you on your time. I don't think, <clears throat> okay. I don't think it's gonna let me uh, share my screen quite yet, oh. but um, I it's, it's um it's my fault. Um, I think it's a firewall thing. I'm uh -oh. borrowing IT's um computer, but um oh actually I can just uh tell you really quickly. So the benefits of um uh genrefying um the books were constantly out of before they were constantly out of order. Now they're easy to spot when they're out of order. I just look at pictures. I can see like unicorn, unicorn. Oh cat. And I take that out. Um, it's customized to the school culture. Um, and then students are finding age appropriate content. Not, I don't go by, try not to go by reading levels, but I talk about content, um, which uh, sets them up for like interest and success in what they're borrowing. Um, it's a easy to understand color coding um, and saving money and really fast uh, to shelve. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> um, but I have a, yeah, I have a 75 minute slideshow that I'm also happy to give away. But um, yeah, if anybody's interested in the labels, I'm happy to give that away as well. Sorry, I'm like, wasn't expecting the thing to not share. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you for putting my um, email there in there. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Do, do, does anybody else have any questions for our panelists? or want to share your own experience with the genrefication? I have a question of my own. I, I'm wondering if in well, while you were doing your investigations prior to starting your genrefication, did you find, uh, were there any libraries that were actually including the, the readers themselves in the genrefication? That's a very, very good question. Um, I think it was just a matter of the over the years, what the kids were asking for. They were always asking me for unicorn books. They were always asking me for, for bedtime stories. Like parents were asking for bedtime stories. So based on just kids coming up to my desk, being at the circulation desk, that kind of informed my decision for the collection categories. Like I knew, I knew they were going to be asking a lot about dinosaurs. So I have to have a category for dinosaurs. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And any anybody else want to chime in on that one? We mostly copied the other. We copied the school, like Macapu Elementary on on base. John refined their fiction before we did, so we just kind of pulled a lot of their stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jennifer asked, "Do you anticipate having to switch out genres due to popularity over time?" Sure. Changing tastes. Absolutely. For the, uh, <laughs> for, the for the chapter books. My goal was to make something that was a little bit lasting um, because it was a really huge project. So, you know, maybe, but I basic genres like historical and mystery and stuff, I think they've been around for a long time. So I hopefully not. <laughs> I, I do want to say that apparently our collection years ago, the YA section that um, the adult fiction section and the J fiction sections were separated by genre and someone came along and removed all of those genres <laughs> and like interfiled everything and so when I came in I had to go back and like read genre -fy everything so I'm hoping that uh, if if I'm not here that the next person won't won't then undo that all and then go to the next thing <laughs> Yes, yes, that's something all of us worry about, whether it comes to genreification or some other decision that we made. <laughs> um, and Laurel has put a link to her presentation on genreification with the background history uh, in the chat. So if any of you want to look at that, please click on that link and that will take you there. Uh, are there any other questions 
our, our closing comments before we wrap up. I'm working on putting the spine label um, folder in the chat so you can feel free to uh, make a copy of it. It's on Google Drive, um, but that'll, if you're interested in using that. All right. Oh, thank you, Laurel. That's, I really appreciate all of the information that you're sharing with everybody. Uh, any other closing thoughts? Um, if not, then that will be the conclusion of today's program. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and thanks so much to our three presenters, Laurel, Mary, and Andrea, for giving your time and sharing all of your experiences and knowledge with us today.